Uh, she's a re -spe repeat speaker, both at our gov and at NYR. And she's apparently disaffected of her current job because she wants a different job. Her dream, her dream job would be a panda caretaker by day, which you have to learn Python to do. And then a at-home restaurant tour at night. So pandas and restaurants. We don't know what type of cuisine it is. You need to tell us. Moroccan, but that, you know, I hope you know that. Uh, so everyone, please welcome Asma. Um, well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for braving the cold and being here. I'm Asma Chini, and I'm the Director of Analytics and Research at Pursue Care. Today, I want to talk to you about how we're leveraging open source and professional our tools to deliver evidence-based care for our patients. Uh, so Jared mentioned I am a repeat speaker. My first talk was discussing our experience as a startup. And I'm excited to talk to you guys about the progress that we've made. We're now in our third year of operation. So first I'd like to begin the talk uh, by discussing the crisis we're facing. So for over two decades now, we've faced worsening rates of mental illness, which have had devastating medical, social, and economic consequences at the individual and societal level. From 1999 to 2019, nearly half a million people died from an overdose involving any opioid, which includes prescriptions and illicit drugs. The number of drug overdose deaths has quadrupled since 1999. Uh, just to put it into perspective, that's about 136 people dying every day um, or about a person every five minutes. So this crisis has only gotten worse during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. After an already catastrophic increase in 2020, deaths have risen to a new record in 2021. Mortality data from the National Vital Statistics System show that we've gone from a new record last April of 75,000 deaths in a time span of a year to 108,000 in the last year. Newer provisional data, which isn't shown here, suggests that most states have faced an additional increase of about 6% nationwide. Due to reporting lags, this actually might be an underestimate. So this rise in overdose deaths can be seen across the country, with some states experiencing as much as 50, 60, 70 percent increase in deaths, and it continues to worsen in many areas. Only a handful have had decreases. And given where we're gathered today, um, or close to it, Maryland, uh, Maryland is on track to have its second or third year of steady decreases. And not sure if anyone in the crowd is involved with that work, but I know firsthand how difficult it is and they should be proud of their efforts. Unfortunately, most states are not in this boat, as we can see. And the reasons for these steep increases are complex and vary in nature from region to region. It's true that the pandemic has exacerbated many inequalities across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic class. It's also worsened access to care as many in-person clinics closed or decreased operations. Some clinics never truly bounced back, leading to even further fragmented care um, even in this environment of loosened restrictions. One very important factor behind this worsening crisis is the sheer inadequate number of resources available to patients. So in a recent 2022 study, it was found that among 3,200 counties in America, 78% had no in-person treatment program. 29% um, did not have uh, any clinicians that can dispense life-saving medications for people struggling with addiction. 
So we know people are seeking care, um, but simply they cannot find it in a way that is convenient, destigmatized, or affordable. Maybe I should keep going with no slides. <laughs> um, a little hard to do, but. Um, okay, folks, I'm going to pull Max Richmond here for a second. Matt, are you here? So the first year we had you, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, I'm trying to fix this. <laughs> the first year we had UCR, which was a drug project. Building something like this, well, the audience we had their and Matt started his presentation. Oh, there you go. And so the lady went through that and went and people went to talk through it and talk to I think I was going to say, this is just this is a huge Sorry, Go ahead, something. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so an added difficulty to all of this is the uh, access to these life-saving medications that we just spoke about, uh, which continues to be difficult really indiscriminately of person across sex, age, race, and ethnicity. However, these disparities, according to a recent study, are most severe for folks that are Black, Hispanic. Um, this is hardly surprising, as we know these populations face tremendous barriers to care due to systemic racism. Uh, fragmented care, insufficient medical staff, in under-resourced areas, um, and additional stigma, of course, related to their use of drugs. So I work at Pursue Care, and at the heart of what we do is trying to eliminate every barrier that we can to care. This is why we leverage telehealth technology to meet patients wherever they are. It allows us to meet patients who don't have adequate local resources and who need treatment really fast. We also offer in-person care in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, and we're proud to have staff, local staff there that have intimate knowledge of the dynamics of the crisis on a local level, which allows us to make good on our promise to deliver culturally competent care as much as we can. So in person and virtually, we're able to treat all substance use disorders like opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, and other severe mental illnesses. The flexibility of telehealth not only allows for same day treatment, but it also allows us to implement functionality through our app that we've developed that keeps our patients engaged in their treatment and their recovery. Currently, our platform allows for medication-assisted treatment, one-on-one -on -one with providers, psychiatric care, individual and group therapy, FDA-approved digital therapeutics, and we also have our own pharmacy. Our goals in the data science team is to, broadly speaking, help our organization take better care of our patients. And we have a couple goals that guide us through that. One of them being better understanding our patients. So that begins with detecting trends uh, with the lens of where they are, how they seek care. And once they're in our care, are they meeting their milestones? This involves the continual monitoring of their outcomes for the purposes of implementing procedural changes and personalized treatments. We also monitor the outcomes of those process changes and try to detect any new emerging trends from those. So how do we accomplish this? Uh, well, it starts with uh, a robust internal tooling. Um, so we're bootstrapped, we're a small team of two data engineers, me and a data analyst, and we spend a large amount of time configuring, reconfiguring, and optimizing our stack for efficiency and automation. So being in a startup in, a, in its third year now, we're cautious of right-sizing our tools, 
to reduce overhead costs and use our team in the most efficient and productive way possible. Um, a significant pain point in healthcare is just the explosion of vendors that you will have to deal with, which service us in different ways. We have a vendor for electronic health record. We have a vendor for lab results. We have a vendor for our insurance claims and financial data. And the challenge here is marrying all those data sources together to better understand our practice and our patients. So we, we invest heavily in the maintenance of our data warehouse, which houses almost all of our vendors' data um, and is augmented also by publicly available data summarized from the American Census Bureau and the CDC. So we can enable the data science team, but also our internal and external stakeholders to understand how social determinants of health are impacting our patients which then helps us to implement more personalized treatments and more culturally competent procedural changes. So as we've said, we continue to invest a lot into our data warehouse um, and it was important for us to have control over it and not rely on vendors own data, which sometimes did provision us with read-in database access. But I believe we've saved enormous time and proactively avoided many pitfalls by having our own, um, namely to always have this always on monitoring, surveillance, reporting, and error detection. And we've also cut down significantly on confusion over what certain fields mean coming from the myriad of data sources from our vendors. So with that in mind, we've designed our own grammar or vocabulary for naming data fields. And this allowed really our entire team uh, to better communicate and better collaborate. And this has had trickle down effects from the data warehouse to our internal packages, which also uses the same naming conventions. And it allows us to be faster at writing code for everyday data wrangling tasks. So speaking of internal packages, uh, we've taken the time to develop and refine um, sort of our internal stack beginning with um, ETL processes, DB connections and queries, uh, a new one that we've developed this year is data validation. Uh, we were very heavily inspired by the point blank package, which helps us do uh, regular data quality assessments. And finally, we're continuing to refine our data manipulation and data visualization internal packages for uh, common repeated steps that we do. And so all of that internal tooling helps us with better understanding our patients, detecting trends, and being on top of any data quality issues that arise. Now, in terms of monitoring our outcomes, we have four that we um, check on and develop models for on a regular basis. Um, so both the data science team and our internal stakeholders work together to establish these um, and they involve engagement, uh, meaning engagement with our care and our app, uh, retention in care, how long do they stay engaged with us, their drug use or lack thereof, and adherence to the treatment plan as set out by their expert providers. While some outcomes are you know, derived by simple counting and, and grouping, the majority do involve some additional lift due to the nature of the data and the uh, complexity of the analyses. So we make very heavy use of the tidyverse, tidy models, BRMS, and some causal inference packages. So how do we actually deliver these analyses to the stakeholders in a way that balances ease of use, maximum insight, but without overwhelming the viewer? And we found that an approach 
of carefully curated reports spanning non-overlapping facets of an analysis is uh, successful for us. And we found that these two serve us very well for our purpose. Um, I was very intrigued by Shirley's talk on Quarto, but I'm not quite ready to make that jump. Uh, maybe when we have a more multilingual team, but for now we are 100% an R shop. And so we make heavy use of R Markdown uh, for several advantages that I'm sure the audience is uh, very well aware of, but um, we do make heavy use of it for our more static reports. And for simulations and modeling work, we tend to make use of Shiny for a more dynamic experience. And we love using R Markdown because its flexibility is great in organizing chunks by the purpose that they serve. Um, I know personally firsthand that some of my earlier reports were not the best constructed. So having that flexibility to change it, refine it, all in a reproducible and version controlled way is really powerful. And the flexibility of the outputs have allowed us to quickly iterate over reports based on stakeholder feedback. And the portability is great too. As we know, uh, it can be published on a publishing platform. Um, it can be a PowerPoint document. So it really spans um, many, many um, different ways to publish your results. And a recent and really exciting addition to our workflow is the use of the PINS package. And admittedly, I've been kind of sleeping on this uh, for too long, but for those who are unfamiliar, it's an awesome package designed to share and publish data, models, and most R objects by quote unquote pinning it to a board. This is really perfect for our use case uh, because we often need to reuse data and uh, track changes in those data sets and running historical point in time analyses. So this has really allowed us to move completely away from storing any point in time data in Excel or shared drive, um, which is a win in my book. And so that's all good, but how do we actually get our results from our local machines onto the hands of our stakeholders? Um, so it was immediately clear for us in the beginning that uh, our Studio Connect, now known as Posit Connect, made a lot of sense given that our entire workflows were built in R with a Microsoft Azure uh, backend. But we've been impressed over time with its flexibility and ease of use for all our staff. And this is really reflected in our usage data that we can take a look into and pause it, connect. And I'm so proud by the way uh, the staff, um, no matter what technical savviness level, uh, use it and give us feedback. So I think this is really what it's all about. For me, um, my role is to make this a truly data-driven and evidence-based company. And I feel like these tools truly allow me and our team to do that. So with that being said, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, please hit me up, email, Twitter. Thanks. <laughs>